Up until 1980, Latinos in Indiana in the United States have been statistically invisible. So um, we're looking at different reports, there wasn't anything that could you can pick up and say, oh, a, you know, these communities live here. New at 11, an effort to shine a light on Circle City history and what was lost when thousands of buildings were torn down decades ago to make way for interstates. Our Two Americas series is shining a light on stories and histories of the America you know and the America you might not. WRTV's Amber Grigley takes us to a community from the past that had its future forever altered by a massive project meant to connect the country. These were all houses up and down both sides of the street. Just imagine moving to a country with little to nothing for a better life. There was only maybe maybe a thousand Hispanics in the Indianapolis area when I was growing up and we all knew each other. Only to have everything your family built stripped away for an infrastructure project. Well, that's the experience of the first Hispanic community here in the Circle City. They were upset, but, and my dad tried to fight it, but, you know, he couldn't, you know, the government wins. <laughs> that community, now known as the Los Barrio, Barrio Spanish for neighborhood. Beginning in the 1920s, a small community of Mexican Americans lived in the area of North, Davidson, Pine, and Market Streets on the east side of downtown Indianapolis. As an adult, you look back and you think of all the times, the fun times you had in this area and the, your schoolmates, other friends and family, and we were all a close-knit group and we didn't understand why we had to move away other than the fact the highway was coming through. That's all we knew. People living in the Los Barrio community were among nearly 17,000 Indianapolis residents displaced by highway construction. According to Nicole Martinez Legrand, Indiana Historical Society's Multicultural Collections Coordinator, the construction was part of an infrastructure boom of new highways and interstates in the mid to late 1960s. A lot of people were displaced, but they moved to different areas. It was kind of staggered out in which um, they have all left. The Espinosa family was one of the last holdouts um, because of, you know, they had their business. Husband and wife Feliciano and Maria Espinoza and their eight children lived in a multi-story house on East North Street. Feliciano worked for a railroad company and was able to plant roots here with his family, living the American dream. And my dad was very into um, helping the community and, and doing things like that, so he was... Um, he was pretty well known for those reasons. Beyond his community service, Feliciano and his wife operated what is known as the first Mexican grocery store, El Nepal Market. It was located in front of their home. After they lost the store, they did hold have a stand in the city market for a while. And so um, they, they sold merchandise through there. Uh, Mexican things and Cuban foods and things like that. Though the market continued, the Espinosas left their home behind. I was still in high school at the time, um, but I think the people just accepted it because, you know, it's the government telling you to do something, and so you just accept it. And I don't know if they got a fair market value for, for their homes. I, I, I really don't know that. Uh, I know we went into a much, much smaller home. <laughs> The house we lived in there on, on North Street had two kitchens and several bedrooms and bathrooms and everything. The house we moved into on Highland was one tiny little house with maybe three bedrooms. And we had eight kids and two adults, so there were ten people in, that, in the family. Both Connie and Reynaldo Riojas tell me they were too young at the time, but remember a fast transition between leaving their homes and the start of the new interstate project. It's pretty tough. I come back earlier, a couple of weeks ago, and looked around and uh, tried to remember how things were because it was just it was a different place. History wiped away for the city's interstate system. I don't look at it as just a neighborhood. I think it is a large extended family um, and people who you know have created wonderful memories and have contributed a lot to 
um, Indianapolis. For years, these stories about the lost Badio have been omitted. That's kind of frustration and research that a lot of people do who um, do Latin American research in the United States. It's the most surprising because it also does not exist physically, in the physical sense. Um, there is still a vibrant um, community of people who live there who are still connected, who are lifelong friends. And uh, and that's one way that the barrio still still lives here in Indianapolis. Last year, like Martinez Legrand began shedding light on this community, bringing together former residents and allowing their truth to shine as an important part of Indianapolis history. It, it impacted everybody on a personal level. We all have a little bit of a scar from everything that happened out here. History that influences Indiana's Hispanic community to this day. I think it's tenacity, right? And so, you know, how can I make my, how can I be a better parent to my children? How can I be a better person? How can I make my own business? You know, how can I bring more money to my family? It's a lot of these different things. And I think that just kind of, you know, everything else, you know, the benefits of that um, just kind of go hand in hand. Working for you, I'm Amber Grigley, WRTV. And you can learn more about the Lost Barrio, the people who live there, and the resources available today for the Circle City's Latino residents. It's all in this story at WRTV.com and the free WRTV app.